hear about now, so please welcome uh, Peter. Thank you, Heidi. So let me tell me a little bit about my own background. I've been building clean rooms for Philips Microelectronics for 10 years. And from that point on, I had a very nice idea what clean air w was and should be. Uh, then I worked a couple of years for a research company and I was nominated professor in Delft uh, combined. And then I worked for large scale consultancy uh, corporations. Now, in those corporations, we built a lot of hospitals uh, where we could apply the knowledge from indoor air quality to operating theaters, for instance. Um, and uh, I, I became a sort of an uh, operating theater specialist and an indoor air quality specialist. But of course, there are a lot of machines using a lot of energy and who imply a lot of um, problems into our environment using those um, so those systems and so I became interested in that and um, finally I ran into Michael Browncart and uh, we were very compatible and we have done uh, quite some things together including presentations research etc so that is a little bit about the background and um, what Heidi is already oh yeah, um, of course I'm with TU Delft Delft University of Technology this is my own company nowadays so I quit the large consultancy and I now have my own uh, inspired ambitions. Uh, inspired is really the fact that I'm in greatly inspired by Cradle to Cradle, but I'm not only Cradle to Cradle. So today we'll discuss the difference between sustainability on one hand and Cradle to Cradle on the other, which from my point of view is exactly the same as the difference between energy and exergy. For those who do not know what the concept of exergy is, which is thermodynamics, no problem. In five minutes, I will explain it to you. Very simple. And finally, it's also the difference between efficiency and effectiveness. That, that word we've seen today already a few times. First of all, just to explain uh, a number of definitions. Uh, what is sustainable? In Dutch, we only have one word for it, duurzaam. And that's a problem because uh, the English has two uh, meanings. It is either durable, it uh, has a long life or it does not run out, or it is sustainable. Uh, which we uh, uh, thank the definition to the Danish. Thank you for that. Um, it is, let's say, um, very important, as we already seen in the other presentations, to come from what you could call a linear economy to a circular one. I can, if you not have seen it yet, uh, really uh, encourage you to look this up on internet. It's a presentation of 20 minutes, beautiful, and it really explains the difference between linearity and circular uh, economy. Um, then we can uh, also define what is non-sustainable. Um, it is uh, based on two uh, aspects, both the consumption of natural um, resources and the effects of the consumption. This is oil production and we reached, uh, I think that everybody knows that term, peak oil, so the total production is only going down. Uh, we will find new, uh, new, new uh, quantities but it will never be as much as it has been. And you can easily calculate when we will be running out completely. Uh, the same goes, and even in shorter terms, for a lot of materials. So there are the years left of the different materials in this uh, graph with a 2% growth increase per year, which is not very uh, accurate. There will be much more, the growth increase. And you can see that even uh, relatively normal materials are on this list within 50 years. It's also an interesting uh, material on this planet. Um, there is, from the total quantity of water in this world, there's only 2.5% fresh. 99.6% of that part is still frozen or underground. 0.4% is really at the surface and available to us. If you do the math, it is approximately uh, 100 ppm contamination of all 
contaminated water, so it is very, very rare. Uh, and we use it not very sustainable because you know the quantity of water which is needed to make one cup. Does anybody know how much cups need to produce one cup of coffee? 100. We use 1100 times the amount of water to produce one coffee. It's really incredible. And we contaminate it. Uh, other materials contaminate the air, of course. And also the ground. And the top bottom, either by uh, contamination filtration, um, are all ways to reduce the amount of uh, uh, available good topsoil. That is about the non-sustainability. Then you can ask yourself why, if the previous slide was not enough yet, why we would go into sustainability. Is it uh, purely idealism? Is it the government who is enforcing new legislation? Or is it the fact that some companies have the idea that they are lagging behind and they would like to run, be a runner, be a front runner? Uh, we have seen a lot of market pull on sustainability. In fact, we believe that in time, uh, the sustainability is a value which cannot be ignored. Um, uh, during the, in, in the process of designing in a more sustainable way, we also encounter a lot of had not seen up until this moment, and I'll come back to that one. This is a financial incentive in order to, uh, to be perhaps more sustainable. It is before the credit crunch, but I thought it was very interesting to show it. It's the mean value of stocks who call themselves CO2 neutral, whatever that may be, and how they have defined it, or how they really do something about it. But they do it a lot better than the mean stock exchange. So, very interesting perception. Terminology. Um, so, we boards like this and uh, discuss. Um, I'll take out one. Um, sorry for the Dutch, but it is an original um, piece taken from the internet. It is a press release of new build building in Holland. Uh, from the company TN, and they, I'll um, translate it for you, they opened their first CO2 emission-free office. Emission-free, I think, that is interesting, because nobody is allowed to work there, because as you sit here, you all produce CO2. Uh, but in the same, they uh, contradict themselves, because they talk about CO2 neutral talking about and this is greenwashing is bullshit. Uh, other terminology renewable it can be either energy it can be uh, bio-based material um, and you have to understand that renewability does not mean that you are sustainable so it's easy to not be renewable like we do the fishing of a sustainable the fish uh, uh, commodity. And for example, to see that sustainability does not necessarily mean that you are durable. So a tree has a lot of uh, photo cells uh, which it sheds every year. It's not very effective. It's not very durable, but it's very effective. And it's very sustainable. <coughs> so when I introduced Michael Brownberg to Royal Hoskonen, which was the company I worked for, um, we had a group of some 40 people gathered around him. And these were all um, solicitating themselves. They wanted to work together with Michael. They wanted to be inspired by Cradle to Cradle, apply it to their own projects. But these were people from incredible Other were engineers, some were from the Alpha studies, and all sorts of people sitting around the table. And we really had to come up with uh, a common language in order to understand what we were talking about. We all talked about sustainability, but we all meant different things. So 
we came up with a scheme in which everybody could find themselves and in which all elements were represented. Now the first one is this, the elements. It always goes about energy, water, materials and topsoil. And the mobility was put uh, separate here. It is in fact an energy uh, issue, but I'm not going to di discuss that in uh, great depth now. Uh, then, if you ask any ecologist, what are the biggest ecolog ecological problems at this moment, he will come up with health effects and with biodiversity, the reduction of biodiversity. Uh, Michael doesn't want to add climate change, but I think it is really one of the uh, ecological problems at this moment. Um, scarcity of materials is, uh, is an issue. And just to have one example, you can reach, read it for yourself, but diversity is really going uh, down at a very uh, great uh, space. Another example, um, also about biodiversity, uh, interesting one. It is in a city in Holland, in the south of Holland. It's called Soetermeer. Here there is low rise, uh, high rise, and here is the old center. Um, uh, based the number of people per hectare increases from left to right and if you look to the biodiversity it also goes left to right which is completely counterintuitive but it is a very nice example to show that high density people don't necessarily mean a lower biodiversity um, as I showed you the um, uh, peak oil production this is peak phosphate production it's already told Phosphate is in and we do not recycle it anymore. We do not reuse it anymore. We consume it and therefore we have a problem in 50 to 70 years time. The quantities which are still available are also incredibly strange distributed. One third in China, one third in Morocco and the other spread around USA and South Africa. Um, to say something about how sustainable somebody is or how cradle to cradle somebody is, there are certification schemes like, uh, uh, or first you can calculate life cycle analysis. Green Calc and Eco Quantum are Dutch uh, programs uh, designed to do this. You can ask any authority to give him your blessing to say you are the most sustainable one. Um, or you can go to LEED, Braham and many others in the built environment. Uh, uh, they are mostly a pride. Uh, and also Cradle to Cradle has its own certification scheme. Now, the interesting thing in um, bycatch, what we had when we were talking about um, sustainability in indoor environment, is the co indoor air quality in terms of uh, beneficial uh, indoor air quality for people. And you can find that, amongst others, in uh, productivity. Now, this was in the 30s and you could measure easily the productivity of a um, uh, conveyor belt employee at that moment, just counting the number of telephones that were fixed. In an office area it's much more difficult, but there are even also very good Scandinavian indoor air quality researchers, uh, amongst others Sepane from uh, Finland which now gathered a, a lot of indoor environmental <coughs> research into quality, qualitatively high standards and combined the results in terms of really uh, yeah, the relative uh, productivity um, versus ventilation rate that is used in the, both those buildings. Or the perceived air quality, uh, which is a method by also a Danish uh, professor who is now uh, uh, who died a few years ago, Fanger. And uh, finally, the temperature. And the point is that in our time, we were challenged to design buildings in the cheapest way. So the architect thought of a plan, then we had to come up with uh, installations and they should be as cheap as possible. And there was no discussion whatsoever that they could be more expensive because that m might benefit the people. But now we can turn it around. Um, a normal organization, the costs for those organizations are 80% defined by salaries. 
if those salaries are not working uh, to the maximum uh, capability, then your profit is really going fast away from you. So nowadays the discussion is much more that we should have very good indoor climate and very good indoor climate conditions because to perform under those conditions. Um, the other one is uh, what is already called the happy healthy school. Uh, the students at Delft which are thinking of this uh, greenhouse on top of school buildings. Okay, now we are going to combine the different elements that I've been defining. Um, sustainability um, is based on a scale level. Are we talking about molecular contaminants or are we talking about the planet? Um, we talk about the aspects, the energy, water materials, etc. And we're talking about the challenges we are confronted with. Biodiversity, health effects, climate change and scarcity of materials. I have one slide on the scale level. And then we'll go uh, matrix. So the scale level, this is, um, let's say, a um, ministry in Holland, in The Hague, which was uh, planning a renovation after 15 years already that it has been built. Incredible, but nevertheless. And we designed this, uh, this workshop where you could uh, go from, let's say, different uh, scale levels, the workplace 1 meter to a corridor 10, A350, building itself 150 to its environment or a part of the city. You can discuss the different aspects, energy, water, etc. And uh, what it helps you is to see that if you cross scale levels then you can apply different technologies. If you cross the scale level of the building itself you can go to aquifers under Integrated. If you go to um, this level and this level, there's a lot of ministries and then suddenly all the questions came together. Why do we need all those different cafeteria? Why do we need all those different gymnasiums, etc.? An interesting exercise. But now we go to the other. The other uh, encounters the, uh, the challenges and solutions or ambitions, you can say. First is the aspects, energy, mobility, water materials, top story. And I'm not going to read them all, but just to give you one or two examples. Logical diversity, health effects and climate. So half of the total. The other half is used to express um, how you are going to do an improvement on your project or an improvement on your way of uh, uh, organization, you organize uh, things. This is the total and you will get it in a PDF form so no need to copy it, quite difficult. Um, and you see that we saw it until this point in the previous one and here we talk about the judgment. It's also about economics of course, about cost benefits, about PR as a uh, aspect which uh, is uh, important and about equity and not in the financial term but in the social uh, context. But to give you one or two examples, uh, if you take a closer look to energy you see that the ecological uh, challenges are all chemicals, SO2, NOx, CO2, the scarcity itself is the oil of course, the fossil fuel, um, and if you go to, let's say, the cost-benefit relation, then uh, this is the traditional way. We do an, um, an, an change in, an, in a design and then we uh, ask how much is that costing extra and what does it bring us and then we divide the two and we have the payout time, the payback time, which is a very simple and very stupid way to assess integrated uh, aspects. Um, the other one, uh, which is already better, is a life cycle assessment over a certain life period. But uh, total cost of ownership is, um, is, is a more, even more interesting one. And finally, total life cycle costing is really an interesting approach. And what does that differ from a normal uh, design? It is different because you're not only looking to the investment cost of the building and the operational cost of the energy and the operational cost of cleaning the building, but you're also going to look to, let's say, a minimum of 15 years changes to the building. Organizations have a very good idea what they change 
to their building the last 15 years. And if you ask them, are you going to behave better, better in the next 15 years, they all say, no, we are still going to change the building in different ways. So to design it in a more flexible way is a very good investment in uh, a lot of cases. So you have to include those costs. You have to include the cost of non uh, productivity uh, because you did not invest the right uh, uh, air handling units and you have to uh, pay for the cost of sick leave because the climate is not optimal. So if you do that then you have a completely different design scheme and are asking in how much years are we going to earn that back. Uh, a last one example just to understand it um, it is uh, to look to fairness. In Holland we had a scandal. It uh, is associated with the name Proba Goala. That is the name of a ship who tried to get rid of toxic waste in Amsterdam. And because it uh, was uh, uh, too tricky, we refused it. And then it sailed to West Africa, where they put it on a dump. And that is a very efficient and a very simple and cheap way, by the way, so it's very good to get rid of our toxic uh, waste, but it's not fair to the, to the native uh, African people. We're all on one planet and we have to deal with our shit uh, together. Okay, um, that's one part. Now we go into more technical part, into uh, the energy part. The energy consumption of the 27 uh, nowadays uh, European Union countries um, it is a bit uh, detailed, so I'd better take another one from the same uh, site, which is incredible site, by the way, European Energy Agency. You can download thousands of these graphs over there. Very, very, very interesting, uh, very up-to-date also. So the point is that over the 27 countries, we have uh, approximately one-third, slightly less than one-third, in um, transport, one third in industry, and the others combined, you could uh, call the built environment. So 40% of our total energy consumption, or here somewhat less, but in Holland it's 40%, is going to the built environment. And in the built environment, we have incredibly efficient technology. We use high efficiency plus, plus um, uh, boilers, which have efficiencies which are uh, de defining on how you, uh, uh, depending on how you define it, um, uh, nearly or above 100%, slightly above. We are very proud of that, and so we do a very good job. Now, the question, is that really the case? Um, in order to understand the answer to, to that question, you have to introduce exergy. Now, exergy is, in fact, um, Oh, well, well, this is uh, one slide with uh, thermodynamics. Uh, to understand the first law of ther thermo thermodynamics, you can say there is conservation of energy. So here's potential energy, here's dynamic kinetic energy, and it is conserved. Um, the second law of thermodynamics, in fact, says that heat cannot be transferred in work for 100%. That is the definition. Uh, you can define it in a lot of different ways, but I understand that this one is the easiest to swallow. Uh, so if you have work, that's beautiful. That is one, that's the maximum that you can get from uh, any source for energy. Um, if you have heat, you cannot transform that completely into work, which is um, yeah, the other way you can say quality of heat will always decay and exergy is not conserved. Now the quality of energy, you can also call it. It is, um, let's say, if you take a closer look to work, electricity, chemically bound energy, then it's all for 100% to be converted into work, theoretically. In practice, it will be slightly smaller. Heat, you are bound by a certain efficiency, which is the Carnot efficiency, and the Carnot efficiency is, in fact, um, it's a cycle. It's a cycle like you have in your refrigerator at home. But in this case, you produce work with it. Um, in order to understand it, you have one formula, which is this one, with which you can calculate the different amounts of exergy um, destruction. In fact, 
that we have in our boilers. The first one is uh, gas in, which was 100% exergy, you know, so that's good. But then we make the first mistake, we burn it. And by burning it, we get a flame temperature of 1200 degrees. And you can calculate easily that then you have an exergy loss of 20% just by burning the gas. Thou shall not burn. Um, but we do not need 1200 degrees to heat our homes. So we are going to do anything in our power through heat exchangers to reduce this beautiful 1200 degrees to, let's say, uh, somewhere in the order of 40 to 30 degrees, where we still have 3 to 6 percent of exergy, and we are nearly successful in destroying all of the exergy that was present in this beautiful gas. So we do not have an efficiency of nearly 100 percent. We have an exergy um, destruction plant of 8, 94 to 97 percent. It is really incredible. It's like we are shooting with a cannon on a mosquito. It should be forbidden. Quite sure how the company in Denmark is called who is um, reselling natural gas uh, to, um, to, to, to companies or houses. In Holland, that's the Gasunie. From a dynamic point of view, a criminal organization which should be a bad, terrible. And in addition to thou shall not burn is thou shall not heat exchange, exchange heat, because that's also a very efficient way to reduce the quality of the heat that you have. So in fact, what should we do? We should uh, generate heat at the temperature levels that we really require. Or we should recycle heat in some cases from ventilation air. It's a beautiful way to recycle the heat from the, uh, the air that the, the we put in. And <coughs> <coughs> sorry, there are many better ways. One of them is adding a Stirling engine, which has the highest thermodynamic um, uh, efficiency, the Carnot efficiency, to our gas burning boiler. And use the 1200 degrees centigrade, not as a starting point to. Uh, to, to Destroy, destroy the exergy, but as a starting point to power this small energy delivering device. It's producing electricity. Electricity is 100% exergy. It produces approximately 15%. It's not very impressive, but above the 3% that we had for the gas boiler itself, it's an incredible increase already. There are other ways uh, we can use heat pump technology. Aquifers, this is a building that we realized it's the headquarters of ING Bank in Amsterdam. And we use aquifer technology over there. And aquifers are water carrying layers in the underground, which are stagnant, and where you can put in heat or cold and take it out later. So basically what we did here was make a an hot and a cold aquifer. Specifically, the cold aquifer is the most outperforming uh, unit. Because what we do, we put in wintertime and in uh, as, as long as it's colder than, let's say, 15 degrees centigrade, we put the cold into the ground just by using a pump. And then in summertime, we take it out. Now here you see measured data for this building for the cold, um, required cold over the different months. And here in uh, a year totalized. And it is 68% of the cold that we need for the building is taken out of the environment when it was cold outside, and we put it in the ground and later take it back. There is 30% of the cold is generated by the heat pump while it was heating the building. So a heat pump has a cold side and a hot side. And when it's heating the building, you can harvest the cold, put it in the ground, and use it again. There's 2% of the energy we had to generate by traditional uh, cooling. Uh, this building needs quite some cooling because it's completely of glass, but uh, we're not going into detail now. So here you see the performance in finance. It's also interesting. This is the boiler, and it's in euros per megawatt hour. It was, I think, in 2004, so the data are already slightly uh, old, but nevertheless. The boiler, 50 euros in a megawatt hour. The heat pump, 30. The heat pump and the chiller as the chillers. 
25 to 30, and the aquifer 3. So it's an ecological interesting uh, approach, but also an economical interesting approach. These were, let's say, thermal cycles, and you quickly come to biological cycles uh, that inspire. So algae are very interesting. You can say um, the production here, uh, it's, it's a um, basic um, setup in Holland. Somebody produced algae over there, then he dried it. So they grown algae in Holland. And the, the, the most stupid thing, but the, the first thing you might do is you can burn them and then catch the CO2, re-inject it into the water, grow new algae, and so you have a nice cycle. This is an artist's impression of a very large-scale algae plant. Or macro, like this one. So these are easier to harvest than the micro ones, and this one I like so much. It is the idea that a car which is running on um, methanol, which is uh, synthesized from um, the biomass that is produced using um, algae. Um, not very practical, but certainly not impossible, catches its own CO2 when it's riding. And when it goes back to the pump in order to get a new shot of methanol, then he is, al he is also allowed to return its CO2, which then again is uh, changed into biomass, which is changed into methanol, etc. And you certainly have an idea <coughs> about a very effective um, biological cycle. So, in practice, we produce a lot of CO2 in the built environment and also with uh, NOx and SOx, which are all nice inputs for those type of algae grown uh, plants. Uh, so, we can say we have a problem with CO2. We can also say we are too stupid not to see that we have this beautiful material CO2 which we can harvest and then uh, make biomass out of it. And if you take a closer look what is in, it's not only oil proteins and different gases that come, to, uh, that come along, but there are also omega acetic fats, uh, uh, acetic fats in it. Now, if you can harvest those, then you have the concept of what exergy is on a material level, the quality of the biomass. Therefore, I always have a problem if people talk about biofuel, it's biomass, and please use it on the quality level that it lead, lets you use it. So waste, what do we do with our waste? Um, this is uh, a typical way they did it in uh, America uh, many, many years in landfills. In Holland, we did a much better th uh, job. We burned it. And that we call sustainable energy. It is the most stupid thing that you can do, I think, to really uh, burn it just for uh, harvesting the thermal value. Uh, nowadays, we do it slightly better. We also have some wind and uh, with different things, but nevertheless, we still count this as sustainable energy, which is, by my opinion, by my opinion uh, incredible. Um, you, well, we already talked about down and recycling, and cradle to cradle introduces the upcycle uh, thought, and that generated with me the question, what is the value of waste, by the way? Or, what is the value of materials? Now, the first material I thought of was gold. And the price at this moment is 40,000, 42,000 euros a kilogram, which is not very much a kilogram. It's uh, like a good shot of whiskey. Um, yeah, there it is. And it also gives you a nice reference, because uh, if it would be 50,000 to so have a round figure, then with an, uh, the specific mass, a milk pack would uh, be one million euros. So a millionaire has one pack of milk filled with gold, and a billionaire has a cubic meter of gold in his house. Um, but a kilogram of gold also comes from, um, of course, the, the, the ore that we win in uh, gold mines, but then you have to process 200 to 1,000 tons but it's also present in a cube of seawater of this dimension, 425 meter. So it's very fine dispersed. There's a shitload of gold in the ocean. But are you a millionaire if you have so many uh, tons of water, seawater? 
I don't think so. The, in the more interesting one is you only need three and a half tons of used mobile phones to have a, to have a kilogram of gold. Uh, and if you are able to take it out, you also take out nearly half a ton of copper, 10 kilograms of silver, um, palladium, platinum, so very rare materials. So this is really going to be the next level of urban mining instead of just taking out the thermal value. Okay, I think I already told you this one. Yeah. It's uh, interesting to see how the development as of 2002 has been. Yeah, there it is, the milk carton. I forgot about this one. Ah, this is nice. This, this I want to share with you. Um, so, the historic gold production. So, you, they, they have quite a really uh, all um, detailed information about how many gold was won over the world, and they have that in one database. So if you would be able to bring that all together, you would have a cube this size, 20.7 meters. And then I thought, what would be the uh, deficit of the United States? It's bigger. There's not enough gold in the world to compensate for that. It gives you also a perspective of why we still <coughs> keep quantities of gold uh, in reserves, but okay. Uh, that one I also already mentioned, but it is really uh, one to the other. It is energy versus exergy, and it is sustainability versus cradle to cradle, which is the bridge to cradle to cradle that I needed. So the principles of cradle to cradle already mentioned. I'm not going to repeat them, um, but I will show you a few other slides from Michael Braungart. This one is also very much about the quality in terms of toxicity of materials because we contaminate out the products that we give to our babies incredibly. Um, I'm not a chemist, Michael is, but he um, ensured me that a lot of these are either toxic, carcinogenic or mutagenic, and that the quantities, these spikes, are relevant in terms of emissions to those toddlers who are going to consume all of these nice chemicals. Um, and the point is, the previous one was made in China, but under the auspices of Mattel. Uh, Michael always um, also tells uh, people who he's meeting, and at that time he was, and he's a little bit cocky about it, at that time he met uh, uh, the President of the United States, that was the, the, the younger one, uh, what's his name, I forgot. Uh, no, 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 the, 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 the Bush, thank you, Bush Jr., the small one. And at that time, there was this discussion of the league for weapons of mass destruction. And he said, well, you don't have to go to Iraq for that, uh, or to Afghanistan or whatever. Go to Mattel around the corner. They, they supply it worldwide. So. And the interesting thing is, it is absolutely not necessary. This one is produced in China as well. It was the mascotta of the, um, of the World uh, Fair in uh, Shanghai. And this was uh, the comparable uh, one. You can say, I see two peaks. Well, they were to calibrate the equipment because they thought the equipment failed. Uh, so there's uh, the possibility to really take everything to a biocycle and a technocycle. I'm not going to repeat that again with the examples that are, have been discussed already. And this one you know now as well, also. This one was drawn up by an architect within Haskoning when he was involved. And I asked him, if you think about cradle to cradle, what do you see for possibilities? So it's an uh, impressive list. And this was my view on energy and exergy in uh, cradle to cradle. So uh, there is a link uh, from biodiversity with a very zero tolerance expectancy from cradle to cradle in terms of waste equals food. Thou shalt not litter your environment with chemicals or toxic or carcinogenic, mutagenic materials. And then going into the built environment and from the built environment to the materials it is made of, we have the same comparable um, zero tolerance policy. So the health effects is really thou shalt not uh, put any uh, toxic chemical or uh, 
uh, to defined levels, uh, carcinogenic materials, etc., in those uh, products, which can be leading to emissions and exposure to people. Uh, the scarcity of materials is also helped with that <coughs> by introducing the techno cycle. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, from my point of view, you should also look into the climate change and use sustainable energy and the concept of exergy to overcome those problems. Uh, for instance, using solar energy and the already mentioned um, large-scale algae producing, uh, um, producing facilities. Well, Michael is uh, also a visiting professor at our faculty. Uh, he comes around each month. Uh, Elaine is also uh, there and some other PhDs. And these are very f uh, interesting and fruitful uh, discussions uh, in, uh, the, um, in the sessions. Uh, what time is it? How much time do I still have? You have uh, 20 minutes. Oh, okay, yeah. that's, that's good. A little bit based on questions yeah. Uh, this one is interesting as well, although it is stopped at this moment. We were in the process of trying to work with a group within our faculty who is into neural networks and into um, genetic-based uh, algorithms. And they used that in order to come up with uh, interesting designs and design solutions. And we had the idea, can, can't we also put it onto uh, cradle to cradle? So we came up with the first scheme and then wanted to start with uh, using the scientist of uh, Michael to, to work on. It was a very large project, but it has stopped, unfortunately, at this moment. Nevertheless, I would like to show you what such an, uh, <coughs> what such an uh, simulation could look like. In, in this case, is it going to... Exp yeah. I had put this out. It is um, uh, a design solution for IKEA all Scandinavian examples. And the uh, design is uh, optimized around a couple of perceived uh, aspects. So the guy is also an uh, expert in uh, visual perception. And there are four uh, parameters which are constantly changed by the computer, by the way. Uh, we gave him that freedom. That is the building core the mezzanine and the ducts and the stairs. Um, he comes up with a certain solution. He has, um, the neural network is going to describe how good uh, the, 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 the connections uh, are. And then he comes up with a certain solution which is ranked at a certain level. Uh, and then he, from a certain group of solutions, he picks out uh, very different solutions. He pairs them in a real genetic move and then he starts generating new uh, solutions. And what you always see is that after some hundreds and thousands of mutations, then your ideal, which is one, is really going to be achieved. And uh, this is work, which is absolutely uh, mind-blowing, stupid work, uh, which you much better can have the computer do. Now, this same type of approaches, uh, we are going to look in the future to apply to cradle to cradle, cradle to cradle designs, and come up with a figure how cradle to cradle a certain uh, either design or a certain uh, method or a process could be or is. Well, a few of them we've seen the green walls, we've seen uh, different ways for food and biomass production. We already talked about the greenhouses on rooftops, also to uh, include uh, food production. Biomimicry is a word that we've seen a few times. And organic PV cells is very, very interesting as well. Uh, this is really, might be one of the future uh, developments that really allows us to, uh, to reach for this uh, solar energy. Well, here we are with different design approaches for Cradle to Cradle. We came up with those. Uh, at the beginning, before um, uh, the publication of criteria, Cradle to Cradle Criteria for the Built Environment. By the way, it very much looks like the title of today, but it was a complete different one. Uh, we've got energy, water, material, topsoils. Uh, and these are mine um, interpretations, by the way. So producing more sustainable energy than uh, you consume, that might be an uh, interesting uh, way for water 
just make a better water quality out, as in produce more topsoil than you consume and um, close the cycles with materials in terms of bio and techno. Uh, now I have to make a quick change to show you the publication. That is this one. Cradle to Cradle Criteria for the Built Environment, which is much more extensive than what I showed you a moment ago. Nevertheless, um, I will show you a few examples how this really can be achieved. Now, I'm not going to do that again. First, I see we go back to nature. Yeah, just to underline that a tree and nature uh, is not very efficient. Uh, it can be durable, but not necessarily. It is effective and is even beneficial. And that is a concept that I would like to use. So if you zoom in to one of those issues, energy or water or, bio or uh, topsoil, uh, and it is beneficial, then it produces more than it consumes itself. But not always in a defined way. I'll show you two examples. This was when I had the greatest uh, discussion with Michael, uh, his eco-efficiency opposing eco-effectiveness. Uh, from my point of view, these work together, and I'll show you how. So eco-efficiency, I agree, it's just less waste, less emissions. And if you're talking about energy, you're talking about the efficiency. Well, <coughs> whereas with eco effectiveness, you can uh, talk about no waste, no emissions, or the concept of a positive footprint. Now you've seen the great importance of this concept of a positive footprint. And you reach beneficiality, and you have to use energy uh, if you talk about energy in this respect. Now, this is a good. A um, colleague of mine from Germany, Norbert Fisch, who has designed his own new house in uh, Stuttgart. Um, and I'll show you some of the results. But this was his idea in first instance. This is the standard uh, data they use in order to define the quality of housing in Germany. Um, you talk about a certain uh, embodied quantity of energy and you talk about an energy consumption over the lifespan of the building. They also have the approach with the passive house, which is uh, even better. It has slightly more embedded and uh, a lot less energy consumption, but still it is consuming more energy than it uh, could produce. And he wanted really to go not only to an energy neutral or an energy positive building, but a building which would be relevant in terms also from its embodied energy. And he achieved it. So in this period of 10 or 11 times, well, it's, it's just built, so he has to prove it over 11 years, but all uh, calculations indicate that he will, that in approximately 10 years, he will not produce more energy than he itself sustainably generated but he has also paid for all of the embodied energy and he's really a positive energy contributor to his environment from that point of view only energy this building cannot be big enough and that is the concept of a positive footprint if you clean your water to a level which is better than it comes in your building from an energy from a water point of view cannot be big enough that is really a complete different approach. So this is the building he put on, uh, I think, 120 square meters of uh, PV and 7 meet square meters of solar uh, thermal. Uh, he generates uh, approximately 150% from what he is needing himself. Well, what he needs himself, approximately two-thirds go to uh, appliances, one-third is going to um, his, the, heat, the heating, and the other one-third of what he is generating, he stores in his um, electric uh, car and scooter. And only then, when he still has excess of electricity, it goes back into the grid. Uh, this is the house and his car and his scooter. Here you see the PV, and it has also a very nice view. So, um, now, the same concept plays to water. It is uh, in Delft, in Holland. It is a uh, uh, company, Pharma Filter, which works together with clean up the, the water, all the water from sanitation, but also uh, all the 
uh, biodigestible tools that are shredded in this uh, machine over here. And it is generating water at this moment, which could be drunk. You definitely may not say that it's drinking water because it comes from, uh, from people. That's why it's forbidden by law. But if you increase it one bit more, then it is better than the water that uh, comes into the building itself. So a very interesting development. I saw another one. I'll go quickly through this one, which is very interesting because it uses, um, uh, let's say, uh, only sustainable energy. So it uses solar energy and solar heat to be powered. It is using vacuum technology. Therefore, the forces are also quite low. Um, it produces incredibly clean water. Really, this is, uh, it is better than cleaning water. You can use it in, uh, in, uh, in laboratories. Um, and it is, um, uh, the feed water can be anything. It can be seawater, so it can be a desalination plant, or it can be from the, uh, from the sewer. Low pressure, low temperature, so all good examples uh, that you should, um, that, that it is very good in itself. So th now I come to the last part, and now I'm going to confront efficiency and effectiveness. The, just to understand that we talk the same uh, talk. Efficiency is doing things right, so, uh, whereas effectiveness is doing the right thing. Very large difference. And you can do, you can do bad things very efficient, like burning gas in boilers. Uh, this is very efficient. And it is absolutely not effective. <laughs> now, if we apply that to a boiler that we saw earlier, so we have gas, we burn it, and we produce heat. So the input is uh, gas, work gas, thermal energy coming out, and uh, the energy efficiency is uh, d defined by eta. Now, eta energy is the energy which is t in the uh, quantity of heat divided by the energy which is. Uh, uh, represented in the quantity of gas, but we can also define an exergetic efficiency, and that gives us the exergy in the quantity of heat divided by the exergy in the amount of gas. Now you know that the gas was on 100% exergy, uh, so let's see. I have five examples for you. The boiler. Well, I, I, I told you 100%, but in practice it will be slightly lower because stops, stand, stop, and starts again. But let's say 80 to 100%. It doesn't matter because the effectiveness, how we defined it, is only 3.3%, whereas the total effect, which is in fact the exergetic efficiency, is 2.6. So it is the, the product of this, the efficiency, and what we called the effectiveness, which leads to an exergetic performance of dramatic proportions. Now a heat pump is much better, uh, but where does it improve? It has our definition an efficiency of 225%, which a lot of people feel very uncomfortable. That's why they call it a coefficient of performance, but in fact it is just the efficiency as we define the other ones. And where, why is it bigger than one? because we do not account for the quantity of heat that we get for free from the environment. So we only count the, what we get, the heat, and what we have to put in electricity. But we also get a shitload of energy from the environment. Now the effectiveness is exactly the same. How does that come? Well, basically, <coughs> um, um, the heat, this heat pump that we assumed is electrically powered. How do we get electricity? by burning gas, not in our boiler, but in a very large boiler somewhere else in the country. This electricity is then transported to, uh, to our heat pump, uh, which generates heat of a certain temperature, and we have to cool that down to the level that we really wanted it, uh, 30 to 40 degrees. So we're burning gas in order to generate heat of 30 to 40 degrees, exactly the same process as we had in the boiler. So the effectiveness is exactly the same, only the efficiency is much better, Therefore, we go three times higher. Stirling boiler, we add the Stirling efficiency to it, 15% in electricity, beautiful. So we raise even to 18.2 over here. And we can increase, the Stirling boiler is only a very small combined heat power generation plan. If we take a bigger one, then we can increase uh, even uh, to, uh, let's say, 30%. And a fuel cell also 
uh, powered on natural gas can so uh, a little heat. Now a lot of people are shocked because they say you compare different things, apples with oranges or apples with pears as we say in Holland. Um, because the boiler is only generating heat, whereas the Stirling boiler is generating heat and electricity. You cannot compare. I say, well, okay, you're totally right. I did not put them next to water to compare what comes out, but to compare what we do with our natural gas, because they're all natural gas powered. And exergy is the way in which we can judge how good we use uh, the uh, capacity of this gas, of this natural resource. Um, we have five technologies which from which this one represents 40% of the total energy consumption of our country. And we do the, really the, 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 bad, the most bad uh, performance with it, 2.6%, whereas the same uh, available technology does do it 20 times better. So we can use the quality of our gas at this moment on a commercial base 20 times better than by burning it in uh, a boiler for a house. So the last ones, um, it's, it's often just a point of view, a difference in a point of view. Are these emissions, CO2 emissions, are they just a problem or are we too stupid to see that there is a chance or even better? Um, these are uh, palm oil plantages which produce an, an incredible amount of wastewater. It's biologically contaminated. Now, do we need a large-scale water cleaning over here, what my colleagues at uh, Ross Koning thought? Or uh, do we uh, see a possibility for a commercial performance by basically harvesting the, these nutrients, these bi biological nutrients, and then uh, see, uh, oh, by the way, we've got also clean water. It's exactly the same proposition, but it's a completely different way how to uh, resolve. So, the question is, are we doing the right things? And you've seen a lot of examples uh, that's obvious that it's not the case. Um, or are we just doing things right, even very bad things? And I saw a very nice representation of that in China. <laughs> Fall into the water, careful. Thank you very much. <laughs>